maybe set up in their basements, yeah. you know, and they don't yeah. need to pay a hundred or two hundred an hour for big studios anymore. Whereas here, like, uh, it's affordable. Ooh, we gotta keep this in the video. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the first episode of the Audio Barn podcast. Thank you. I'm joined with Martin Bennett, owner and CEO of Studio Loco. Yes. So today the point of the conversation is basically just to bridge the gap between artists around the city, mainly, and someone who can provide services that are a little different than just a home studio. Okay. And to get to know your perspective on other stuff as well happening around the city. First, I'd just like to know, like, how does someone start <laughs> <laughs> with something like this? How do you get to this? I wonder if I should hold mine too. Sure. Um, the first, I, I think to start that you just have to want to make it happen first. Sure. It's, it's not like uh, something that's hard to materialize. You know, if you want to, you, you just have to be passionate about it and then the doors will open, you know, in a sense. I started to take music seriously after I traveled. I sort of, I traveled uh, to Asia, I was fascinated in Asia, and I got really into musical instruments uh, from Asia, such as the sitar. Mm -hmm. I was a hobby guitarist before, and then I just got fascinated with music, and I realized I really want to do music. So when I got to Montreal, after I decided to settle here, because I met a Canadian girl, <laughs> And um, I settled in Montreal and I met a whole bunch of musicians and uh, mainly from Latin America. And we used to do a lot of uh, crazy jams, hence the name Studio Loco. And this was in the first studio I had on St. Laurent and, um, and St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. So um, Around when? Started in 97, okay. but the jams were happening before that, around 95, 96. It was just like we were just kind of, we were just having some crazy, crazy jams. So I started, the site decided I wanted to record this stuff. I already had a background in engineering. It was a general engineering course I did, which involved acoustics. So I was also interested, I got really interested in this side of things. Mm -hmm. So I started to record and I, I put an ad in the paper and um, I started to get uh, my first first artists started to come and it started picked up from there. I was trained by <clears throat> properly by an engineer that had a studio for 20 years. I was He was living with me at the time. He was teaching me, I was teaching him in English and he was teaching me how to do engineering. He would come in halfway through the sessions and tweak the mixing board and just kind of, you know, he was showing me a few things. It was like more or less hands-on learning, using my ears, using, um, you know, just, just, just learning from my past knowledge and, mm -hmm. uh, and it started like that. Wow. You said you started as an engineer? I started as an engineer. Okay. Uh, I studied as, a, an engi as an engineer. Okay. And instead of um, getting a proper engineering job, uh, well, I, well, a proper engineering mm -hmm. job like that, not an, a sound engineering job, but like a more general engineering, uh, mechanical engineering or anything but sound, right. I decided to get into sound engineering, which is a totally different area of right. engineering. And that just happened because you were... You just happened to fall, like you just had a liking towards that? I just or? had a liking towards it. Okay. But what really kicked the studios off was uh, back in the, in the late 90s, that was the start of the web. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend of mine who became a, well, back then it was Webmasters. Okay. And he, uh, he actually didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. I suggested, well, why don't you become a webmaster? Which is basically making websites, promoting websites, okay, so and developing. Doing, like a, so, like so he got to know this, and eventually he taught me how to promote my website, uh, which is why I managed to get to number one in Google for pretty much years. Like I was number one in Google under Recording Studios Montreal, and that's what really made the studio grow. Okay, that just like boosted it. So whenever anyone would just type it in on Google, it was yes. on at number one. Now and now it's not like I'm in the top three, which is still good. I, mm -hmm. I lost my number one place, but mm -hmm. I still never really have to advertise. Wow. So that's how the studio took off. It just 
boomed because um, I was number one in Google. So at the end of the day, it's all about promotion. Yeah. If you start a studio, it's all about promotion. It's like it doesn't matter how good the studio is. It like you could just be an average studio, mm -hmm. but if you're like seen, people will just come to you. It's kind of ahead of its time in a way, if you think about it. What do you mean? Like the way that you did it, because it's sort of that's sort of the way everything is now. Exactly. So I was I got it at the beginning of that. Wow. I had a website that I actually made myself with uh, back then. It was f using a lot of flash websites with a uh -huh. lot of animations. But uh, yeah, I was uh, lucky enough to have a friend who showed me all the tricks to get my website to number one. Wow! And, and then it was just then it just took off from there. That's pretty crazy if you yeah. think about it. Yeah. Because like that's literally the base of how everything is now. Forget exactly. This. I exactly. mean, outside of music too. Yeah. So what happened was a lot of bigger studios than mine at the time didn't get on that wave. So they didn't get to number one. Yeah. It was like it was it was just, you know, seen before any other studio. I mean, obviously they can there was other studios there, but the fact that I was number one, you know, made people call me and I, and then once they're called on the phone I can convince them to, to come. Plus my prices were a lot lower uh, okay. than bigger studios. So it was a big um it was a, it was, you know, that's how it all took off. And for what we see now around it's just basically one large room with a mm -hmm. lot of different parts to it. Yeah. You know, the booth, there's the green screen. Yeah. You have like a little uh, the computer set up with the yeah. uh, with the speakers and stuff, but yeah. Was it how was it when it first started? It was sort of similar except the control room there. Mhm. Mm um, my the computer and the setup was all behind a, a glass. Okay, so more of like the, this classic sort of It was of a studio. classic look with all the studio behind the glass and then the main room was the recording room. Nice, okay. But I realized I didn't really need that. Um, I didn't really need to separate my side of it with a with glass and everything. So like that's what, what made you realize changed. that? Uh, I was aware that the mo modern studios didn't need that. I had a look at other studios. It was just the the fad at the time. You didn't actually need the classic look anymore. All you needed was a really a, a, a really insulated recording booth, mm -hmm. and it made sense because a lot of people coming in here, with, you know, a lot a lot of artists like to bring friends. <clears throat> right. They record a lot better with friends. Mm -hmm. So I can see a whole bunch of people. They can talk. They can. Uh, have a sort of little party mm -hmm. while someone's in the booth in an ISO booth and I'm not hearing anything inside there so that just it just became a case of like well what's the point in separating my side with glass if I don't need to almost like miscellaneous at that point exactly doesn't not even necessary yeah exactly okay so how long have you been in Montreal then because you said you moved around a bit and then you got uh, to I Montreal. Came, um, I traveled a bit and then I arrived in Montreal in 92. So I've in been the, here for over 25 years. Okay. And when you first came, it was always sort of the goal was the same thing to be an engineer that has... Uh, I, I didn't actually... My goal at the time was I just wanted to... Uh, I knew I wanted to take music seriously. I didn't expect to start a studio. I was in a few pro musical projects at the time. Um, just so that, personally. Yeah, it was like, um, it was just after a few years I decided that I wanted to uh, start recording. Okay. And then the jams is what glued it together? The jams glued it together. Like the musical talent here it was incredible. Like yeah. there's, a, there's just like a melting point of different talents from all over the world. And it was just a, a huge wake up call to just experience uh, so much talent, mm -hmm. so much unrecorded talent. Right. I just felt like I just wanted to 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 start recording it, right. and originally it was just for my projects. But then I decided, well, you know, I wanted to record other people's and actually start up a, a, a business, a studio business where people would come and record. Yeah, because uh, like I said before we started, I did a, like a, a bit of research on the studio and yourself. So like, there are a few interesting credits that I sort of jumped out at me which was like the doing like some soundtracks for some shows 
like uh, the, heroes. And yeah, that was that was order. that was a bit that was great when that happened. Yeah, it's okay. very hard to get these things going on a regular basis. It's pure luck at the end of the day. Can you sort of like walk us through how that even? How that happened, uh, yeah, right? How it happened. Um, at the time, I was really making mu- work, like I would call it world music, mm-hmm. and I would did a search on Google for, I did a search world music wanted, just just to try it. World I, you music know, wanted. 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 A oh, wanted. Wanted. Sorry. Sorry. So I searched in Google for world music wanted, and I literally went deep into it. I went like thirteen, fourteen page, fifteen pages. I went really every listing I possibly could. And eventually I, I, I found this publisher in L.A. who, um, and I contacted him and I sent him my music and he really liked my stuff. Okay. So then he uh, uh, he put it in his bank and then he called me out the blue. One of my songs he, he, he seemed really interested in and he wanted to do a buyout for $1,000. And I went, um, I, I wasn't sure if that was a good deal. It sounded like he already, you know. So anyway, I said no, because I wanted um, mm. royalties. That's when I understand right. what royalties were all about and how the music industry really works. So um, I decided, uh, no, I want to do to, to do it just on a royalty basis. Um, Can and, you explain, sorry, could you just explain what a buyout is? For okay, okay, who, right. Who might not just, okay, who bas- might not know. Basically, um, when when the piece of music is used in a it was for this for this it was for a trailer for for heroes right so when it's used for that it gets you, you get um, the first thing you get is what's known as a sync fee okay which is like a fixed hundred I think it was one hundred and fifty dollars plus you get royalties which is the amount of time it's shown so let's say it's shown for two minutes yeah you get um, a certain amount of money for that two minutes. And you get the royalties is like you get it every time it's played, right? Every time it's played, you right. get you get you get royalties for that. Right. And as that happens, because they had about eight characters, they had eight different trailers. Right. So it would get paid played whatever, like let's say thirty seconds times eight. Yeah. So I'd actually have four minutes, and four minutes in the f- in video and film industry is is actually pays a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. It's just that it's just the way it is. So. For sure. So having that every week, because it was a weekly show, like it was just basically yeah. I was getting my music eight played eight times each time it was the trailer was shown, which was multiple times every so it was week. Eight times just for one show, basically. Yes, per per trailer, but it wasn't played eight times. One trailer was played multiple times, eight times. You know, because wow. there was eight different types of characters. So it got anyway. The fact is, it got played a lot. All right. So a buyout is when when let's say the the publisher would go, okay, how about I just, I'll take the royalties for it, I'll take the sync fees, I'll take basically all that money that I could make from it. We didn't know at the time how much it would make, so right. you just don't know. I mean, maybe it will make nothing. Okay. Maybe it'll make, maybe it'll just be shown once, if at all. So um, he bought, offered me a thousand dollars, you know, as a buyout, so meaning basically that uh, no matter how many times it's shown or whatever, he would just make the money. Yeah, and you'd just make that one time. I'd make it. I would make a thousand dollars. So it'd be sounds. like you know, it's it's quite tempting. You know, if someone offers you a thousand dollars for a phone right. for for a song. It's like you just like it's quite exciting. You know, for sure. you know, it's like the first the reaction would be sure. You know, uh, you know, it's like you're lucky to get a few hundred. You know, and if the anything. credit is pretty good too. Um, what's that? The credit, like getting placed yeah. in like a... Exactly. Because when Heroes came out, it was a pretty big show. Yeah, I didn't even know it was going to be that big. Nor did he. So in a no. sense, he's sort of taking a chance too. I so see. it's it's not always like he's trying to rip me off. It's like he's he sees a little opportunity and he's taking a little bit of a risk too. Okay. So I said no because I uh, he was telling me that the guy was pretty much going to use the song. So I knew it was a done deal. So I said no, and then I hadn't heard, and then I didn't hear from him for a few months, and I went, oh, I should have just taken the thousand dollars. <laughs> and next minute, you know, um, calls me again, and then I started to get um, sync fees and royalties, and I started making um, sort of more than tens of thousands, which is, and it was just like, uh, wow, you can actually make money with this with with royalties, and that's right. when I realized that this is where the money is in the music industry. I was just going to say, that's, again, for the, someone who maybe doesn't know, that is what, like, the artist is trying to get to. Exactly, but it's not that easy. Because no. what I did was I ended up making a similar song 
thinking, okay, well, I'll just make another song like you it, have a and uh, maybe I'll get it in. But no, it's just not. It's, it's pure luck. It's like you're you're in a bank of songs, and the chances of them choosing yours are. It's a little. Sometimes it could be a needle in a haystack. It's not something. It's not like you just go out there and okay, I'm going to make a song and I'm going to get it in a trailer. And it's it just doesn't work like that. It's like it's you just have to be. It's it just it's just luck. A lot I mean, of the time. I was just gonna say the sort of the method of how you got to contact with him is sort of unorthodox in a way. Yeah. You're just sort of like, you almost like, not that you ran out of options, but it just you're just like, you know what, I'm just going to throw it out there. And yeah. If someone attaches themselves to it, then that's what it is. Exactly. And it's so sort of... It, it did work out. I mean, um, it was, you know, and as I said, I tried it again, and mm -hmm. I still have his contact. He still has my music there, and nothing's really materialized since. I mean, mm -hmm. I've had other 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 songs in in documentaries right. you know but it's never been quite as big as the heroes one that yeah. was like the uh, the king kong i mean the the other credit that i saw as well was the law and order credit yeah they Which once is? once you're i didn't actually realize but the uh you got with socan you get yeah. a listing of all the all the uh you know where it's actually shown, mm -hmm. and sometimes I'm not just not aware of where the money's coming from, and and then I saw Law and Law and Order uh, prop up there, and I went, oh, they used it for Law and Order. I didn't even know. I didn't even see it. I didn't even look at it, and and it's very hard to go back and find find it. But uh, it was one of these things where you just found out afterwards it was used. So you didn't even know that someone was using the music, or afterwards I knew. Right. You know because you know you put your you put your music in a bank of of like a a, a publishing bank. Mm -hmm. Some some are big, some are small. His happens to be not that big, which okay. is good. Yeah, but you're not necessarily guaranteed that they're going to choose it. I see. So it's just sort of the same uh, individual you were in contact with for the heroes credit. Yeah, exactly. Happened to happen. Uh, they happen to the Law and Order people. They've happened to find it in his bank mm -hmm. and they used it. What an incredible! Yeah, it's just pure. It's just pure chance. That's so surreal. As an artist, that's what you're trying to get to in a way, which is like an, a royalty-based uh, yes, income in exactly. some sort of way. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you know, like, if you get into film music and music scores, that's where the big money is. Because if you have, if you're in a film that actually makes it pretty big, you know, you're going to make some really good money with that. All right, for sure. So let's. We're here in Studio Loco, basically, right now. First of all, is there a team at Studio Loco? Or is uh, I work with freelance engineers. Okay. There's just stuff that I just cannot do. Okay. I, I could learn it, sure. but um, I have one guy that deals with dubbing. Okay. He does, I don't know if, you know, in Netflix where there's multi-languages you can choose to, oh, right. to actually right, right. have a voiceover actor dub Each over. One. Okay. This involves like um, uh, software, which is just it, it's, he uses um, Voice Q, which is a very specialized software. He knows it like the back of his hand. So I'd rather just pay him to 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 do that. Right. He also just arranges all the voice actors. He does everything, you know. Okay, cool. So um, for this type of work, I have a I have one guy there. Cool. I have. Um, another couple of engineers that are on standby if I'm not available. So it's more like a on call. Okay. You know. But you for, so you're just at the head of it and I'm at the head of it. Uh, from my experience people to w prefer to work with one engineer. Right. People are generally quite shy when they come in. Yeah. They're they're like they're they don't, you know, I have had times where I've had an intern Okay. And that just didn't work out for me. It's <laughs> like why? one guy was started yelling at the intern, like, "Why is he here? What is he doing here? Uh, I don't like him looking at me." And he's like there on his computer. No, okay, okay. didn't work out. Just putting him on the spot. So then so. that's when I realized that it's just better to work one on one. Okay. You know, and not have let's say two or three engineers. Just uh, I don't really need that. No. I just need one person. I mean, yeah. So things you guys offer at the studio is there's the booth. There's the green screen we mentioned. We're sitting in the space right now where the podcast. Uh, yeah, this is usually this is where the podcast happens for the most part, or mm -hmm. this is the dedicated. This spot? is the dedicated spots. I kept moving the sofa back and forward for podcasts. Right. So I decided to have a dedicated podcast area. And um, 
Am I missing anything as far as the services? Okay, the services now, I got into music videos uh, about a year ago. Cool. And that just took off like crazy. I mean, mm -hmm. I, had, I had that going before, but I would have a, a camera, a, a guy that was doing it for me. Mm -hmm. But it was just, um, it wasn't worth my while because I, you know, the, the amount I was paying him wasn't really worth it for me to offer that service. Right. So what, then eventually what I did was I offered, I had a camera guy to do the, the filming and I would do the editing. So I got into editing. Okay. And then finally I just purchased my camera last year and uh, can offer sort of 4K videos. And now I just do the, the filming and the, the editing myself. Cool. So again, you're sort of at the head of most yeah. of that stuff as well. Yeah, so um, audio recording music videos, podcasts, voiceover, yep. dubbing, uh, they're the main services and right like now. Live, I mean, we have, uh, I think the sh drum set is probably in shot at this point, but like you can do li uh, like live recording and stuff. Usually well. the drum for drum kits, we would go in the booth. Okay. But uh, these days I don't really get many bands. No. Um, no the, uh, I, I used to before, but these days a lot of people are making their music on their computers, making right. uh, making beats on the computer. They bring that here and then they just record their vocals. Get a lot of uh, folklore, a lot of singer guitarists. That, okay. that never dies. No. That, that just seems to go on and on and on. Yeah, There's always yeah. the singer guitarist. For sure. But a lot of people are realizing that it takes a lot to put a band together. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, even though we do, I do record bands from time to time, most of the time it's, it's uh, especially with COVID, it's like, you know, having band practices or mixing with people and that it just it's it's a lot harder to do so so these days people are just um they're making their beats on uh fruity loops is really popular right. uh, that seems to be the most popular um ableton reason mm -hmm. even logic and just basic does yeah. at this so point. people are realizing they can do really good full productions and mm -hmm. with the vsts that are available you can get real realistic drum sounds realistic uh any instrument basically so it's true. sometimes it's hard to detect if it's a band or if it's recorded on a computer All right i guess you've been here for long enough in montreal that uh the question would be how do you see the scene the music scene how has it evolved and how do you see it right now compared to how it was before I guess the last year isn't the greatest reference. I realized that um, music is, uh, it's not just about um, getting known, getting famous. It's a, a lot of the time, it's its actually a therapy. People actually just are happy to record a song and leave it at that. You know, there's not, not everyone's necessarily pushing to, to get it out there. But the evolution of the scene is, I get a lot of rappers like the studio, a lot of the um, pop, R&B, rap, um, and I've seen an evolution in that. It's like it's gone from 90s hip hop to the trap scene right now, which is an incredible evolution. Right. It's like, it's just this huge, big difference, like huge, it's mm -hmm. like, it's not the same. It's like rappers of the 90s, the rappers now is just a completely different evolution. So it involves a lot more, a lot more effects, a lot more creation than the mixes. Right, um, post. Post, a lot of po a lot more post. Um, uh, so there's a lot more trends and just the way people are, are singing, people are rapping, people are, you know. Um, pop music too, it's become a lot more dance orientated, a lot more, before it was, it was um, easy listening, but mm -hmm. then it just became a lot more, you know, just, just more pumping beats, more, more evolution that way. Were you referring, am I like, just to make the question a little more clear, were you answering the music scene in general or, because the question was sort of based on Montreal specifically? Uh, uh, just my experiences okay. from being in the studio. Okay. So okay. yes, I guess it would be my experiences in Montreal. Okay, so it's basically yeah. just mimics what's happening yeah i can only i can well. only really determine like like one one thing i've realized is that the music you know music the whole music industry is very un, a very unfair scene yeah it's, it's very difficult to make anything move you know i recently had a call from um one of my artists who's just he's just like he's had enough he's just had enough he's just did nothing's moving nothing's happening nothing, okay. you know so i'm telling them we'll try and get something else on the side because you know, even some big artists, like, uh, they, they don't just focus at all on music. They have 
they have other things going on the side. Right. It's very hard to just live off of of music. I mean, you know? I feel like uh, the thing you just said about it being unfair. Uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, because you've probably seen things a little differently. But it feels like with the internet, it's opened things up where like the spots on a label, for example, they're no longer uh, limited because you can just do it from your home or you can start your own uh, sort of revenue in some sort of way online. Yes, it's, it's, it's um, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. You have to be really business savvy for that. Okay. Like a lot of the time, you know, do the recording, get a digital distributor, get your stuff on Spotify, SoundCloud, and then just wait around, you know? So that just doesn't really necessarily get any, anywhere. When you say um, wait around, what does that mean? Well, you've got your stuff out there. It's on Spotify. Uh, you could just, like, wait for people to listen to it and mm -hmm. then make your revenues. But unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way. I mean, it doesn't work like that if you're just waiting around, though, right? No, you is have to really mean? be full on into it. You yeah. have to just constantly promote yourself, which exactly. is basically means listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, <laughs> listen to my music, listen to me, listen, listen, listen. Right, right. And it's very hard to do that. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to just uh, to ha to just keep pushing it. And I know I artists that do that, and they're still struggling. You know, it's just it's just really tough to just get it out there. You have to be. You have to be smart. For example, I know one one artist who she's really good at getting to know the bass players or the drummers of bands. They don't go for the lead singers or all the you know they're I they're see. getting the so she she see I guess it was the word schmoochies to to get uh, to to just get to know the more the underdogs of the bands, the I ones see. that nobody really oh what's the bass player's name again? Anyway, mm -hmm. she gets to know know them and before she knows it before and then she, from there she gets like quite well-paid gigs because she she okay. makes the connections right, that way right, so this right. is what's known as being smart about it you know yeah, yeah. it's and, there's a strategy it's like playing chess and, and music is so competitive it's so everyone wants to you know everyone wants to be if you want to get into music you know it's like a lot of people want to get into it but it's just you have to be really strategic when it comes to making it I see. And, and not only that you have to really believe in yourself so if you're like pushing your stuff out there and people go oh it's average oh it's old school oh well i've heard this before it's so easy just to give up or just go oh and then you cut making other stuff and people were all will always shatter your music they'll always kind of you know you're you're gonna be up against a lot of criticism yeah and with that criticism to be able to just go keep listening listening push 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 it's very hard so a lot of people they want to get labels to do that for them getting a label is another is is is, is also a tough one because labels are saturated with people going oh listen to me listen to me listen to me help me help me help me it's not easy it's no. not easy i mean you know? so that's why you're still thinking about it as like it's not fair it's thing. not fair but i'm lucky and like studios we're lucky because um we're like the i don't know the the gold diggers um back you know the gold diggers the, the people that really made the the money back in the days when people were searching for gold were the mm -hmm. people selling shovels okay. so i would say i'm a shovel salesman i'm right. the one that's kind of Okay, I'll record you. You're gonna be really. You're gonna get a great sound. You're gonna have your music video. Everything's gonna be there for you. I just can't promote you, no. but I'm gonna make everything ready for you to 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 be on the radio, to be on, um, get your video on YouTube. But uh, like, after that, it's up to you. It's, it's almost like they need to find the like another person who's gonna do the promotion for them. Yes, or they have to do it themselves and they have to really believe in themselves to do it. Right. I, you know, when you when you're dealing with um selling s your own creation, mm -hmm. like if you're selling like cell phones, you know, someone else's creation, you know people want them. Right. You can it's easy to sell. You know, right. everyone you know, you're not gonna if it's a product that's that's solid, you know it's easy to sell. But when you're selling your own music it's a it's a whole different thing. You're attached to it a bit differently. Too. You're attached to it, yeah. and and you're also more sensitive to criticism, right. and you're dealing with an overly saturated market. It's a lot of luck. It's a lot of determination. There's a lot of belief in yourself, yeah. and um, it's it's not that easy. No, not at all. I no. can't imagine it is. My almost last question, I would say, is uh, how do you see the future of studios in general moving forward the future of studios in general 
I think they're always going. There's always going to be a need for studios, no matter how easy it is. Like, like you can download music software on your computer, but knowing how to use it is is a whole different is a different thing. There's um, people that are just they just don't want to learn that. They'd rather do the they'd rather do the music and record in a studio. I'd say the future of studios would be um, it would be it would really be all all digital. There would be very very little hardware. These days, um, the whole digital plugins and and everything is very very high end now. Mm -hmm. I've sold a lot of um, a lot of my gear because I've done the A B comparisons between virtual you know plugins compared to um, uh, hardware, and uh, the plugins are way better now. Yeah. Back in two thousand and five, when the digital uh, era sort of began in music, it was um, different ball game. You know plugins just weren't there and the analog studios were just like um, laughing at it you know but here 15 years later the, the quality and the algorithms involved in in the uh, digital uh, plugins are just so advanced now that I would see that uh, it, it's pretty much there already when it comes to to the uh, the whole digital plugin world but I can just see it just going to the next level yeah other other types of plugins that just go beyond um, what we know now and just to open up a whole new scape of different audio production when we're working with higher bit rates more powerful computer there's right. probably there's probably going to be a the quality of the sound will just probably be enhanced okay so I mean for me it feels like there will you're getting something different when you do come to one in, like a studio like this, you know. Yeah. The space is mainly what you're getting that's different, but you also, like you said, the knowing how to use the equipment, or yes. the, I mean, the equipment is the plugins and everything. Yeah. yeah exactly. Most of the people that we make music with, they know what they're doing, but it's also based off of what a YouTube video is teaching them or how much time they're spending with it. Right. Which is. I'm not taking anything away from it, but it's just a little different when you had to maybe use some of the hardware and see how it evolved into what it is now. There's probably a, am I, I could be wrong, but it feels like there's a bit of a difference when you evolve with it instead of just having the digital part of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have to, as I said at the beginning, you have to be really into it. You have to be like totally like obsessed, you know, like, I mean, when I got into it, literally, like I was just geeking out all night, looking at videos completely. Right. Uh, at the time, it was like lear learning Logic Logic Pro. Right. It, it's like it's like an old granny that complains all the time. <laughs> That's literally what it is. It's like it's always complaining, yeah, always complaining, like yeah. messages, errors, right. messages, errors. Once you overcome that, it's it's fine. But it's uh, it's it's like endless amounts of geeking out. Yeah. You know, usually doing the night shift all night, just trying to get things yeah. get things done, and and just like uh, that's really. It's just at the end of the day, you just have to be really into it. Right. There's no real shortcut. Uh, there's no there's no real shortcut and it's also just uh, on hands experience like even if you do know all that knowledge uh, you know you're dealing with uh, let's say drunk rappers like arguing rat you know like to, oh I want this effect I want this and they're just like you know people yelling in your ear you know when you're on hand with pe with artists you know you have to be keep centered you have to um, know how to work with people too you know have to make people feel comfortable you know. You don't want to make people feel stressed. So there's a whole science behind not just the technical side, but there's the just just dealing with people, dealing with artists, making yeah. them, you know, as I said, people come in, they're, they're nervous and they're or dealing with like about eight or ten people, a big crew coming in. Right. And um, You have to accommodate everyone at the same time. Yeah, so you just have to manage the session. You have to just kind of... Um, people bring bring their friends because they, they actually perform better when their friends are there yeah why do you think that uh because there's kind of almost like showing off too they're just like yeah you know here i'm, I'm got there's that pressure to to perform better because right. they're listening you know it's and it works you know yeah i mean yeah. everyone works in a different way but that method seems to exactly constantly be a theme when it comes exactly. to that exactly cool um actually the one thing you said that is kind of interesting to me is uh the people part of it, instead of it just being so technical and, you know, this is just how music is done. Understanding how to be around the people as well, apart from them just... Because there's nothing more frustrating than you trying to finish something and someone is 
just yelling at you to get things done and they don't know how to do it. They don't know what it takes to get it done, for example. Yeah, so the like, only way to do that is to just keep doing sessions. Okay. Just keep doing just it. A, you just got to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And you almost like it. build like a wall. To I mean, I was it. lucky enough, as I said, to get to, to high up in Google where I was in a position where I would get a lot of people coming. Right. But if I didn't have that, um, you know, it's obviously, you know, it, it's hard to just keep having experience and just having different people, different, different, uh, Different crews, um, you know, also just kind of doing doing sessions in French, you know, just making right. sure my technical French was was good enough, uh, understanding, um, you know, all types of accents, like uh, French speakers from uh, different parts of Africa or just different accents and just trying to communicate with people, even in English too, just trying to understand what people want, right. you know. Right. Um, just the more you do, the more you just get comfortable with these sessions. Okay. Yeah. It seems pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's just like uh, every year you're just getting better and more knowledgeable. Amazing. Yeah. That's, That's pretty great. much it. I w would say, Martin, just let everyone know the main places to get in contact if they're interested. And I well, mean, if you look up Studio Loco on right. Google, you're gonna see. Uh, you know, Studio Loco Recording Studios, you'll you'll find it there. The website studioloco.qc.ca. Perfect. L O C O. Yeah. You can go to the website and contact me on the website. Or you can dial or you can call me. Cool. 514-913-6041. Perfect. That's it. <laughs> is there anything else that you or is that like No, a... that's I think we covered more than enough. <laughs> Thank you okay, for your time you're, today you're welcome. and having us here. This you're welcome. Great. Totally welcome. Awesome. I think, uh, it's a wrap. Yeah. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, no problem. No problem. Yeah. It was weird. It was, it was weird. I mean, it, it,